Okay, so need to do some thinking about the cloud ceiling project now that the um, Halloween shenanigans is over. And if you remember, we had a collection of LED strips that um, radiated out from a uh, container in the center that is going to be this electrical box. Now, according to our friends uh, that manage the National Electrical Code, you are supposed to keep high voltages and low voltages separate. Makes perfectly good sense to me because, um, well, <clears throat> low voltages are things that people feel safe touching and high voltages should be kept away from things that people uh, feel safe touching. So somehow I've got, and so that's one thing, I've got, this is going to be powered by line voltage, one, uh, 120 volts AC nominal. So I've got 120 coming into a light box, so 120 volts. And off of that, I need to do two things. I need to convert power into a plus five volt rail that can support something like two and a half amps of current in order to power the LED strips. That is one requirement. The other requirement is I have to get uh, somehow um, either plus 5 or plus 3.3 to power whatever microcontroller slash um, Wi-Fi or slash, well, microcontroller slash remote, let's call it. And then there's going to be signaling that goes to the LED strips at either 5 volts or 3.3, whatever I'm powering this from. And this is minuscule. This is like um, just a few milliamps, maybe 50. Well, actually, if it's going to be Wi-Fi, I might have to, I might have to um, supply it with um, approximately 0.5 amps if it's going to be um, acting as a Wi-Fi hotspot, which it probably is, and even if it's acting as a Wi-Fi client, it probably needs um, 300, um, uh, 300 milliamps, so approximately 0 0.5, approximately 0 0.3, somewhere in this range. So I need roughly 3 amps of current to power my um, my ceiling piece. Now, where do I get this two and a half amps from? That's being generous. It might not be generous enough because what do I have? I have 512 LEDs and at maximum, um, maximum, I think they can draw 300 milliamps. So, That could, that could get a serious draw. So I'm going to have to have some sort of overcurrent protection on this supply for sure. Now, if I use a commercial wall wart that includes overcurrent protection, I'll be okay. Um, I don't necessarily want to design one myself, so using one that's off the shelf would be much preferable to using one that um, I designed because, well, I am not a... Um, power, I'm not an electrical designer. Let's just remember that. Okay, now, if I've got 5 volts going here, and if I can use a 5 volt device here, I'm golden. But if I have to convert to 3.3, that means I have to put in something like an um, LM317 or something like that, um, that... Um, can convert the 5 volts in into 3.3 out. 
and that will require a couple of capacitors. This thing shouldn't be dissipating too much heat. We'll do some testing on it um, because it's only got a well, it's got an inherent drop. We can figure out how much heat it's going to create, and it's going to be sitting inside of a fairly large box. And this box can actually probably be used as a heat sink if absolutely necessary. I really don't think it will be, but anyways, there's there's always that. So yeah, <clears throat> that is the power portion uh, that I need to be considering. And then the other portion is the block diagram for how things are going to communicate. So at the base, so suppose I have my device up here, I have my controller down here. This thing is probably going to be plugged in or it could be a battery. Not sure which, probably a battery actually, if it's just, um, maybe, maybe I can even use BTLE so it doesn't use a lot of power. But in any event, this is going to be communicating with this, probably, ooh, not probably, it'll be communicating with this wirelessly. So then the question is, what functions do I put inside of this thing versus what do I put inside of this thing? Well, obviously, this thing has to control. Well, I say that, obviously, but um, uh, this needs pins to control the LEDs. So uh, pins for LED strips. So that's going to need eight pins for LED strips, the way I've currently got it designed. I could probably design it differently, but um, <clears throat> I don't think I want to do that because I haven't wired it that way. So anyways, eight pins for LED strips. So I need some sort of eight pin device. Um, and then it's also got to have some sort of rec re receiver circuitry. Um, uh, at minimum, um, I could communicate across this link all of the different signals that are going to be needed for this thing um, to light the patterns but that's going to be a lot of bandwidth so what I'm thinking is that this thing is going to have um, stored um, animations uh, that you can select between and then it's going to also be able to um, adjust hue and uh, adjust brightness because those those two are um, low uh, bandwidth these are high bandwidth so um, and then also also um, adjust the animation. Okay, so I have to um, have a device that has at least eight pins for the LED strips, can be powered from plus five or plus 3.3. Uh, I would prefer a five volt device. Um, and it needs to have some sort of uh, bandwidth, some sort of way of wirelessly communicating with this. And then this guy, <clears throat> this I want to have low power so that it could be battery operated. And there needs to be a way for when the battery runs out in this thing to turn this thing off just in case <clears throat> where it does there this should still be on a switch so there's still going to be a uh, a wall switch that allows you to cut power so even if this goes off this goes off or if you're in a, yeah yeah definitely so now I have these two blocks that I need to create. 
a block for my control and sending controls to my <clears throat> lamp and then I need to um, figure out how to what device to use to receive the uh, the remotes signals and then drive the pins for the LED strips and be able to store those animations and move between them. So now I've got a block diagram for how to split up what I've currently done which was all basically embedded onto a single Arduino and that is now my design task to split this into two pieces so that this part that controls the LEDs and add some power to and a uh, and a microcontroller can drive those LEDs and then a device that powers this rotary encoder and can communicate with this other device is what uh, is what's up next and now we need to think about that And there's lots of choices. <clears throat> so for down here, all I have to do is read a rotary encoder and its button. So it, how many pins did it need? And then we need to get power to it, et cetera, et cetera. And then it needs to um, communicate out. So this thing really needs um, one, two, three pins. So it needs um, encoder one, encoder two. Then there's a ground, and then there's the button press. So yeah, three pins. Um, so something like an AT Tiny um, 85 would be more than enough. And then if I wanted to use Wi-Fi, I could I could um, use an ESP8266 to add Wi-Fi to that. So that would fit into a nice small package. Um, could also use as a single device an ESP8266 um, uh, in the uh, W in the um, in the what is it the 12A package so this has enough pins and it's Wi-Fi and it's small so that would um, if I was going to be using Wi-Fi would totally work um, for up at the top here now I don't know how many, I don't think this has eight pins. If it did, then that would also, uh, eight extra pins, that would also work up here, and I just have a pair of those. So I'll have to remind myself how many pins an ESP8266 actually has. What is this? That's the 32. Uh, 32, Uno, Uno. Wait, what? Really? Come on, I did not. Okay, well, there's that. There's also the DigiSpark Oak, which um, works in the um, in the uh, particle ecosystem. But I don't think I'm gonna get all up in the Internet of Things biz just for a lamp that I'm gonna use for a few months, probably or. Maybe even a couple of years, if that. So I'm going to say that that is out. Um, and then there's the Wemos, and um, this is a Wi-Fi ESP8266 implementation, um, uncapped. There's a bunch of chips on on here. Um, this is a nice little dev board uh, for this thing. Um, so basically, it's one of these sitting on here with some power management and USB for flashing. Now, um, if I wanted to do over-the-air updates, I might be able to use this as the base station, and then I could um, flash the firmware on here and then OTA it up to this guy that's sitting up top. And I think this if this has enough pins, then I would be a happy camper. Otherwise, I am going to be looking at an ESP32. Um, uh, Actually, that's the room 12. Yeah, no, that's the 32. So in, in order to get enough pins. And so that means I would have to build something like that or use an ESP32 dev board, which I've got kicking around somewhere, but I don't know exactly where right now. 
And uh, yes, so those seem to be my current um, contendas. Now, there's also one other. And I have to do some investigating on this guy. And this is the uh, Red Bear. And uh, I think it's BTLE is what, sorry. I think it's BTLE that this uses. Um, and that would be interesting. And here's its dev board. But I only have one of them. And the ESP32 does BTLE. So I might be able to use that, but um, I might need to do some research on this guy just to see. Man, I should have got a second one. But anyways, yeah, um, we'll, uh, we'll investigate that as well. But right now, something tells me that I am going to be using one of these for the base station and one of these for up top. Um, Where did, there it is. Yeah, this has the, the pins on it. So. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I might be able to do it. I think these are used for the spy flash in here, so. The, these can't be accessed, despite the fact that they're broken out in castellations here. But um, I, I'll just make sure that I, I can use all of these GPIOs. Because I know fast LED runs on this, although it is a 3.3 volt device. It, um, it, I can, I can def, well wait, actually, that means I, no, I still need five volts up here. So I need, a th I need to do some uh, voltage adjustments here. Do I have to boost the 3.3 up to 5 volts for signaling? Or can I power the LEDs and signal them separately? I'll have to check that. So power um, 5 volts signal. 3.3, and this is a question for the WS2812s. So, we'll have to check that. Um, so, if, And if I can use all of these pins. Um, I know that you need to have chip PD pulled down. You have to adjust that for booting, but if you can do over-the-air updates, and you might be able to repurpose TX and RX, and man, oh man, I need to clean the flux off of this. Anyways, <clears throat> that's neither here nor there. And I think GPIO 15 is also used for flashing the chip, but um, it might just be that you don't need it when you're doing OTA, over-the-air updates, and I'll have to check that uh, as well. So... Um, OTA uh, for the for lamp part. And that's if I'm going with this. Uh, do I want to mess with Bluetooth? This is just going to be a remote. I can, I can even have like AAA batteries that are rechargeable. Uh, that could power this. So those aren't... doesn't have to be that low power. Yeah. And I know this ecosystem, so something tells me that what I'm actually finding myself falling into is the, well, what microcontroller are you going to use for this project? Well, the one you know. Okay, 512 LEDs, 0 0.05 amps per LED, so that's two and a half amps. That's why I had that in my head. I did that calculation previously. So the maximum current draw that these things will draw is, is two and a half, plus whatever's coming from here. So if this is a three, this is probably at, at most gonna be five. So yeah, so if this is a three amp, uh, three amp, if this can deliver three amps, then I'm, I, 
I'm running it at its maximum and maximum rated. So, um, <sighs> not comfortable with that, but um, we'll do it on the bench and see what kind of heat it produces and go from there. Okay, so here's what we've got. <clears throat> I did a little digging on this problem that I had about whether or not we can use a 3-volt signal, 2.3-volt signal to power the, um, the pins for the LED strip. And we've got some issues. So on the WS2812s, it is expecting a voltage somewhere between 3.5 volts and 5.3 volts. That is its safe operating range. Now, the signaling is expected to be between, uh, it's going to register a positive, uh, um, a, uh, sorry, a digital high when you, it sees a voltage of 0.7, greater than 0.7 VDD, and it's going to accept a, um, a digital zero at 0.3 VDD. So the range is 1.5 volts to 3.5 volts. That's what it's expecting. So unless you've got a signal that is looking something like this, it is not going to um, properly read the, uh, the signal. So you, you have to have your voltage high above this um, uh, 3.5 volts and it, your voltage low has to be below 1.5 volts. So, I mean, it could be down here, obviously, but um, it just has to be below here and here. So that's a problem because the ESP32, if it's running on a 3.3, it's running at 3.3 volts for VDD. And that means its signal is going to be going, so its um, logic high is going to be approximately 3.3 volts. They say it can do rail to rail, so let's call it 3.3. And its voltage low is going to be down somewhere around zero. It, it's probably not exactly zero, but it's down there somewhere. Um, and I couldn't find that spec, but let's let's assume that it does rail to rail for now. So, how do we get around this? Um, one of the ways you can get around it is putting in some additional circuitry, like um, a level shifter. And some ways that you can implement level shifters are by using a cat. You can put a cat in there. Thanks, Sadie. Um, or a MOSFET. So you drive the high side of the MOSFET and then um, any small voltage in the drain will cause the MOSFET to turn on and then you can generate signals that way. The problem is that that inverts the signal so you have to add some other circuitry um, or some code to invert your, um, your data traffic. So where it's low it should be high and where it's high it should be low and so that introduces some complexity. Uh, or you could have um, a pair of these. Um, you could have one, and you can have these operating at the same rail voltage too. So in, in, in a general case, you would have an input, a low side voltage and a high side voltage, and then you would have a low side input and a high side input. And so what you end up doing is you have a signal on the low side looking like this, and then you have your circuit, and on the other side of that, you get a inverse of that signal. So where it's high, it becomes low, and where it's low, it becomes high. But the peak to peak is V high, and the peak to peak here is V low. Now, you could put a second one of these in he in here, but with both sides at the same voltage, and that would re-invert it. It would introduce some small amounts of delay, but um, uh, I'm not sure exactly how I would calculate how much delay it would add. Anyways, I 
this is a, a second uh, tertiary approach because there's a couple of other things that I found on the web. Um, Hackaday had an article on how to use a WS2812 as the sacrificial line driver. So the WS2812 itself has a um, plus five um, a data line and a ground. What you can, and then on the outside, other side of it, it passes through those three. So you get a data line plus five and ground. Now, typically inside here, these two are connected. The ground and the plus five, and then the data goes in. There's some microprocessor in here that does some stuff, and then this signal comes out. And one of the beauties of the WS2812s is it, in each chip, regenerates the signal so that this is always around four point, um, well, some high percentage of, of VDD. So one, each, one of these chips will improve the signal here, um, each one as it goes down. So what somebody has thought of, and this I thought was pretty clever, is instead of powering your, remember, these things can operate at up to three point, will operate down to about 3.5 volts, and your ESP, while it's a 3.3 device, it will operate safely up to 3.6 volts. So, if you have a nominal 5 volt line, you can use a diode to drop your 5 volts down to 3. Point, what is that? 3.7? No, 3. Point, well, diodes are roughly 0.6 to 0.7 of a drop, depending on what diode you've got. So you're going to get a 3.3 volt signal here. It is a bit low for your um, for your NeoPixel. So the NeoPixel might not light up, but it turns out that it's fairly reliable. At least this is what they're suggesting. It's reliable enough to actually regenerate the signal. So you've got this 3.3 signal going into your NeoPixel from this 5 volts. Jump around this first one, so no connect the 5 volts, and then power your next um, WS2812, and then this data line will be generated at um, a high enough voltage to trigger this 2812. So it's pretty simple. Just a diode drop to um, make, uh, sorry, yeah, five. this is going into 5.5. This is going to be 4.3 in its safe operating range. 0.7 times 4.3 is... Uh, one, two, two point nine, two point nine volts which is less than the 3.3 that the w uh, that the ESP will put out. So yeah, that's one approach and that's the first one that I'm going to breadboard. Okay. That seems to be working. So what I've got I can not disturb it too badly, is a first row of WS2812s that are powered through 
um, a diode to give it a um, voltage draw. This turned out to be about 4.856 volts um, on this line coming from a 5 volt nominal supply. Now I'll have to figure out what exactly the supply is that I'm going to use. And then the remainder of the NeoPixel, so there's no power connection <clears throat> um, here to here um, on any of these. So all of these are powered individually with a uh, with this voltage drop. So all of these are at 4.85 volts, 86, and then all of these are at 5 volts. And yeah, it seems to be signaling at least um, uh, a dozen downstream or 10 downstream so let's hook it up with the 32 and see if it powers all of those appropriately okay so what have we got we've got a um, web server running on our ESP8266 and what that means is that we can control our LEDs by um, sending commands to the ESP8266. Um, there's a simple web server sitting on there right now, but that doesn't have to be a web server. We can rewrite that as something <clears throat> entirely different. It could just be um, reading characters off of an input stream, or um, it could be reading integers off of an input stream, or we can come up with some sort of protocol. We don't have to have the whole overhead of parsing HTTP in order to um, get things to work. So there's some pretty sweet animations that you can get out of the Fast LED library. <clears throat> and these are just um, uh, s some samples from the examples directory. There's some functions that you can use, including um, adding uh, different LED colors together, you can, um, you can, um, there's some um, wave functions. You can randomly add brightness through um, a random function to get that glitter effect. So yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable the, the various different uh, things you can get it to do in that fast LED library. So it's going to be a lot of fun to play with, I have to say. Especially this uh, this fading one. I really like that fading one. Anyways. Especially if you put a bit of diffusion material over top of the LEDs. It makes a, makes a nice effect. So yeah, that's totally going to work. Totally going to work. <laughs> Very pretty. <laughs> 